Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. If you've been with us recently, you know we're doing some work in the book of Revelation. There's kind of a feeling out there that the New Testament is kind of the gospel of grace. It makes everything nice and easy, sure. and it's pleasant stuff. Take your Bible, turn to the book of Revelation, to the 14th chapter, and I want to read what is called the third angel's message, and see if this fits with your model of New Testament theology. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Nice, sweet talk. Nice, sweet it? talk. Why would talk, God talk like that? Can you think of any reason why God might talk like that? Maybe yeah. something out of the Old Testament. Yeah. Uh, maybe he's talking like that, like you would expect a teacher who knows that the classroom is on fire uh -huh. and is trying to organize the students. Okay. Can you think of any other times when somebody might talk like that? Take some examples from God. The, 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 the two times in the Old Testament where there were a lot of prophets prophesying at the same time were just before the northern kingdom fell and just before the southern kingdom fell. And guess what they were doing? They were sending warning messages. You think maybe this is a warning message? It sure sounds like it. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, we might be in for some scary times ahead. Is that possible? Well, there's a lot of uh, biblical passages uh, that seem to indicate that. And when Jesus was here, he seemed to indicate that <clears throat> there would be troubling times. And mm -hmm. if we listen to Paul, he seemed to feel that there would be troubling times. Well, it'll be interesting if you're one of those that has this mark that it talks about. Mm -hmm. Well, last time we talked about uh, Revelation 13, we got down near the end, and it talked about what's sometimes referred to as the mark of the beast. And it says that you can get the mark of the beast on your forehead and on your hand, or on your hand, uh, and that you won't be able to buy or sell unless you have that mark. And then it says this calls for wisdom in verse 18, whoever is intelligent can work out the meaning of the number of the beast, because the number stands for a human name, its number is 666. And you've probably heard lots of <coughs> all sorts of fun things done with that number. So in that environment, to have it easy, you'd want to have the mark. You want to have, want to have that mark, yes. That's kind of in contrast to having the mark in, in what I just read, isn't it? Well, let's see if we can work that out. Go back to the beginning of chapter 14, which is where we're really starting today. Then I looked, and there was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion. With him were 144,000 people who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Now, the mark of the beast is written where? Hand or forehead. Hand or forehead. This one is written only on the forehead. forehead. 
Okay, these people apparently have a different kind of seal. Uh, and w just, just b before anybody uh, says, oh, well, you left out something, jump back to Revelation 7 just for a moment. The first three verses. After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds, so that no wind should blow on the earth of the sea or against any tree. And I saw another angel coming up from the east with the seal of the living God. Would this be perhaps in contrast to the mark of the beast? Sure sounds like it, it doesn't it? Sure. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels to whom God had given the power to damage the earth and the sea. The angel said, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we mark the servants of God with our seal on their foreheads. There's a very subtle difference between mark and seal. There's almost no difference in the New Testament between mark and seal. So here's, they're getting ready to mark people with the seal of God, and the devil says, I want to mark people with the mark of the beast. So that's the two sides, okay? And it talks back to Revelation 14. Uh, we saw it's, it, it's talking about uh, these people who are standing around the throne of God and going on with verse 2, and I heard a voice from heaven that sounded like a roaring waterfall, like a pe loud peal of thunder. It sounded like the music made by musicians playing their harps. What do you suppose that would be? A voice from heaven. It sounds like thunder and people playing on their harps and the waterfall. Sounds like a pretty good rhythm section. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Revelation 1 suggests that the voice of Jesus might sound a little bit like that. Mm -hmm. The 144,000 people stood before the throne, the four living creatures and the elders. They were singing a new song, which only they could learn. Hmm. And if, we, if we're going we're gonna to pop over a little bit, I don't know whether we should. We're just sort of, forgive me if I'm popping around here a little bit, but drop down to chapter 15, the first couple of verses, and it talks about the new song. Look at uh, 15, starting with verse 2. Then I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. I also saw those who had won the victory over the beast in its image and over the one whose name is represented by a number. That would be referring to that one at the end of 13, right? Mm. They were standing by the sea of glass holding harps that God had given them and singing the song of Moses, the song of God, and the song of the Lamb. And then it says, Lord God Almighty, how great and wonderful are your deeds, King of the nations, how right and true are your ways. Who will not stand in awe of you, Lord, who will refuse to declare your greatness? You alone are holy. All the nations will come and worship you because you, your just actions are seen by all. So what are we to conclude from that? We can see that there's a very close linkage between these three chapters, from 13 to 14, going on to 15, and when we get to it, we're going to see there's a very close linkage from, from 15 to, to 16. So this is what we, want to, what we want to see out of that is, these are not, as some people have sort of suggested in the past, sort of independent things. Look, here's 13, and here's 14, and here's 15. This is an ongoing story. Now, sometimes it, it drops back and talks about something that happened in the past or comes forward. I mean, we saw in chapter 12 that it talked about things way back from the rebellion in heaven. Mm -hmm. And all the way to the end of 12, we're almost in the, in, you know, the second coming of Jesus. So it, it does that, but the, the stories are clearly linked. That was the first point I, I think we needed to see in this, in this chapter. And in this, we're seeing what we call the Great Controversy. Uh, this is the, remember, the, the focal point of the book of Revelation, the bottom of the V, if you will. It's called a chiasm in, in, in scholarly circles. And so this is the most important part of the book. Um, and this, they fall between the scary prophecies concerning the lamb horned beast, which we identified as the United States at the end of Revelation 13, and the exciting second coming of the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven in Revelation 14, 14 to 20. So let's look at that for a second. Revelation 14, dropping down to verse 14. Then I looked, and there was a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was what looked like a human being, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle on his hand. Then another angel came out from the temple and cried out in a loud voice to the one who was sitting on the cloud, Use your sickle and reap the harvest, because the time has come, the earth is ripe for the harvest. Now, when is the harvest? What are we talking about? When he comes to get his own. Yeah, when he's Presumably come, the second coming. Yeah, presumably the second coming. Then the one who sat on the cloud swung his sickle on the earth, and the earth's harvest was reaped. 
Then I saw another angel come out of the temple in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle, and basically repeats the story, and now he's, he's going to the, to the vineyards, and he's harvesting. So we see that we started out in chapter 12 with the very beginning of salvation history, really the beginning of sin, and now we're down to the second coming at the end of chapter 14. What are the two harvests? Why is there two harvests? Yes. I, th I think it's just a repetition of the idea. Um, I'm not sure that there's supposed to be anything clearly distinction, distinguish, distinguishing between the two. One is harvest of gre rain, grain, and there's a harvest of, of grapes. Um, well, the second one cast it into the yeah. great yeah. wine press of guess, the wrath of God. Yeah. So I guess you would say that the, the second one is more focused on the, on the wicked. Jesus, remember, talked about the, the wheat and the tares. Yeah. This is a, a sort of a repetition of that. The grapes have often been used to refer to God's people, haven't they? Mm -hmm. Grape vines, Grape vines. And to God himself. And so we're kind of changing the symbolism. Looks like it, yeah. So coming back to our handout, um, and if you're interested in getting these handouts, they are available um, on our website. I encourage you to go there. Um, theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Well, as an encouragement to John, God shows him the story of the 144,000. We read it in 7, we read it in 14, before he gets to the message you read to us, Norm, the scary message. And there, where are these people standing? They're standing on Mount Zion. And what's, where's Mount Zion? The Temple Mount? No, Ma the Temple Mount is, out, is actually Mount Moriah. Oh, okay. And Mount Zion stands between Mount Moriah and the city of David. So it's, uh, it's one of the high points in, the, in, in Jerusalem. Not much there left there then, is it, by now? Well, there's, there's buildings there. It's the middle of Jerusalem now, but there's not much left of... The, well, they, if, you go, if you go there, they will tell you that the that the, as I remember it, quite sure this is correct, that the, the upper room was on Mount Zion. Because hmm. the um, city of David is just to the south of Temple Mount, is right. it not? And then that's kind of where the dump, the Gehenna dump was there right. at Off the time the Jesus was, was here. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. So this would maybe be slightly west a little well, bit? Well, Mount Zion is at the top. Moriah, these are the tops of the hills, and then okay. David goes down like that. Okay. Yeah. And we're looking 5,000 feet elevation here, are we? Oh. Yeah, four thousand, maybe four to five thousand. Jerusalem is. Well, these are not high mountains. They're right. they're on a plateau, yeah. high plateau. If you're walking, you get to go up and down hill. I it's see. It's yeah. not li not like you're sitting at the foot of the mountain, and this Mount Zion is a, is a great big. No, no. Edifice here. Mount Zion is is probably three or four hundred feet above the valley, right below it. That's mm -hmm. it's not that. Not, it's not a huge mountain that just sort of juts out at you. So, so there's the lamb standing on Mount Zion mm -hmm. with him, 144,000 people. This is presumably Jesus standing with 144,000. So this is after the second coming? The New Jerusalem. This is the New Jerusalem? Yeah. This has to be the New Jerusalem. And that raises questions because uh, in the Old Testament we read that when, when the New Jerusalem comes down, Zechariah says... The Mount of Olives will split and go from north to south and create a large plain in the middle where the New Jerusalem will set down. But Peter says, heavens and earth are all going to be destroyed and God's going to make everything new. And, and John says at the end of his book, there's a new heaven and a new earth. Now how much has to be new to call it new? This is a new surface on this earth. What are the new heavens? I mean, you can see why there's, you know, there might be some differences of understanding here. But before we, one of the main things we want to talk about now is what about these 144,000? Now, I, I presume everyone at this table would like to be one of those 144,000. What do we know about them? The very righteous people at the end of time. The righteous people at the end of time, okay. Can we, do we know anything really specific about them? Well, they make it through the last days. And make it okay. all the way through. Let's look at some verses. Revelation 13, 18. This calls, and, and remember, for, it, 
Revelation 14 immediately follows this. This calls for wisdom. Whoever is intelligent can work out the meaning of the number of the beast because the number stands for human name. Its number is 666. Then I look and there was a lamb and it says that they, they've stood against this. So the, the first thing we would say is they have won the victory over the beast and over his image and over the one whose number name is represented by a number. Okay? So they have, they have lived through the time of the mark of the beast and they've survived on God's side. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. And that would then imply that they went through the can't buy or sell part. Yes. Yeah. They lived through that. I well, have a question. Yeah. The 144,000, is that a literal number? Is, or is it... Well, okay. Of all uh, the we people. Could, we could go back and spend a lot of time. Look, if you go back to, to, to Revelation 7, It'll tell you that the 144,000 are made up of 12,000 from each tribe. 12 tribes, and mm -hmm. one of the tribes is left out. The tribe of Dan is left out, and the tribe of Ephraim is added. Mm -hmm. So, and, well, Joseph is actually divided into Manasseh and Ephraim. So, um, that who, raises questions. Who today is from the tribe of uh, <laughs> Zebulun? Well, and that's or exactly. Any of the 10 tribes? That's exactly the question. Uh, so there have been lots of explanations. Some people say each of these sons of Israel, sons of Jacob, represent a different personality type or a different character type. And so there's people of all different types can be saved. <coughs> That's one possible interpretation. Another possible interpretation is that there are going to be 144,000 from the Jewish population, and then there's going to be how many more from the rest of the world? Gentiles. Gentiles. <laughs> well, I don't, I'm, I, I'm sure that it's not some kind of literal number. I'm sure it's not one more than 143,999. Don't you think there could still be a bloodline of all those tribes? I mean, we Somewhere. can't figure them out. But the angels know who they are. They yeah. know where they, even if they'd mixed up and watered down a lot. Yeah, but I, I hope you're not trying to imply that only someone who had some kind of blood connection with Israel can be saved. Well, um, God seems to be able to figure that kind of stuff out for some reason. Let's leave it to him. Yeah. Okay. They will stand with Christ. Number two, they will stand one day with Christ in heaven, having been translated from this earth from among the living. And we read about that. They're going to be standing there with their harps. It's in chapter 15. It's in chapter 14. It's in chapter 7. So now, regardless of whether it's 144,000 or 143,000, is it a big group of people, or is it a small group of people? You, well, we've usually drawn the conclusion that whether the exact number is, is there or not, it's a relatively small group of people. Is well, that, is that relative correct? to billions, yes. Right, yeah. So, uh -huh. few there be that find it, broad is the way, mm -hmm. and many go without. It's that kind of distinction, I think. In... Um, Verse, and let's see if I can find it real quick. You're asking about this. It says he turns and he looks. When he gets to heaven, he turns and he looks, and there, no one could number. The number was enormous, way more than 144,000. Um, so, again... They were I, the ones that were dressed in white, though, right? Those, that number that you're talking about, when they looked at the... Yeah. They were, they were all dressed in white. Yes. You notice back in the seals... Yes. Um, with the people talking under the altar, they were re they received the the white robes. Mm -hmm. So there and might be a connection. There. Yeah, and back in the churches, there's one of the church groups that receives white a uh, white robe. Mm -hmm. Now I don't think they're the only ones that receive white robes. But it specifically mentions that th that particular church, those who overcome in that church, receive white robes. Is there any robe that's described that is not white that's given out? There are some. In one place, Ellen White suggests that martyrs will have white robes with red borders. With a red border, but basically a white robe. Yeah. Is there, is there a reason to shy away from 144,000 being a literal number <clears throat> other than we're just kind of worried that that seems like an awful little tiny bit of people? Yeah. Is that, is that the, we, we just want more people included, and so we rationalize that, is there other, other, 
indicators or evidence to indicate that? Well, that, the verse I mentioned, I should see if I can find it real quick. I couldn't put my hands on it Im immediately. That says, you know, I think it's in act, back in chapter 7. Let me just go back there a second and see if I can find it for you. The fact that they turned and he turned and there was a crowd way too many to number. That sort of implies that, doesn't it? Well, that almost in implies... 7-9. Is it 7-9? To me, that would imply almost an astronomical number. Almost something beyond... Beyond... Uh, well... You know, the planet or something. No, I, I think... I think, uh, I think what God is trying to say is that He's going to win with just. He's not going to. He's not going to win with, you know, five or ten people. He's going to win with a significant number of people. And, and I guess you would also imply that it's from a variety. It's not just a, a, a very homogenous group. That it's it's. There's a lot of variety included yeah. in that number. If you look back at chapter seven, as I suggested, uh, and it goes through the the, the 144,000, 12,000 of each tribe. And then it says, after this I looked, and there was an enormous crowd. No one could count all the people. They're from every race, tribe, nation, and language. And they stood in front of the throne of the Lamb. So if you read the verses just before, it says there's 144,000, 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel. And now there's an enormous crowd from every race, tribe, nation, and language. That certainly implies they're not all from Israel. Does it imply that he was looking in one direction, then he turned and looked in another direction and saw right. a, a, a right. big awesome. crowd as opposed right. to the 144,000? And it says there will be certain special privilege of the 144,000 yeah. when they get to heaven, so maybe that's why. Mm -hmm. So, Anyway, they will sing this new song. And we already looked a bit, little bit about the new song by comparing Revelation 14 and Revelation 15, and it's the song of Moses and the Lamb. What what was it? What 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 does that mean? The song of Moses and the Lamb. Where does that come from? What well, does song mean? Does it actually mean a singing choir yeah. song? Well, but their their idea of harmony so far might have been different than ours. But yeah, it's a singing song. Because I remember the old gangster movies when people would sing to the police. Yeah. You know what that meant? Yeah. No. And that's. We're not talking about gangster movies here. Well, well, no, that's not my point. My point is the meaning, yeah. the meaning there is, yeah. is what I'm speaking of. Yeah. Well, after the Exodus, uh, yeah. Miriam... Uh, what yeah. happened? Right after they, when they crossed the Red Sea and they were safely on the other side and in the morning the, the waters came crashing back together and, 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 and drowned the Egyptian army, Miriam led all the women in singing a song. And that's the song of Moses and the Lamb. So they're all, 144,000 are women? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I'm saying that this is a, this is a, it's again, it's some, a, a picture taken from the Old Testament. Here are the people who, who just finally escaped slavery. They've just achieved their freedom. And now here's a new group that have just a, achieved freedom from the sin, from the slavery of sin. And now they're singing song. Okay. Appropriately so. Appropriately so, absolutely. God. <laughs> They've come out of great tribulation. I mean, yeah. certainly we, we they can understand. They came out of slavery. Yeah, exactly. Well, not just that. They, these people have been through the time of Jacob's trouble. They've been through the great time of trouble. They've been through the seven last plagues and on and on and on like that. They've been through a lot of stuff. Yeah. Five, they have passed through the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. They have endured the anguish of the time of Jacob's trouble. We've mentioned a couple of those. They have stood without an intercessor through the final outpouring of God's judgment. Boy, that sounds kind of scary. What is implied by that? Well, I've heard some contemporary, at least amateur theologians, com complain about Adventist theology being interpreted as humans being without an intercessor for a while. Mm -hmm. You're finding this in Revelation, are you? Yes. So, so what are we going to do about that? Maybe you won't need one. Okay, why would they not need one? First, what do you mean by an intercessor? Well, okay, and I'm, I'm <coughs> doing this a little bit tongue-in-cheek because there are those who believe that the whole 
point of, of the plan of salvation is that Jesus forgives us of our sins. And if he gives us a, forgives us of our sins, then he no longer has to punish us. So, because, you know, there's, he's got a billboard up there. He's got, and he's, you know, and every person's writing their sins every day on there. But, and hopefully at the end of the day, we can, we can write it off and so forth like that. We can get these things erased by having them properly forgiven. And the key to salvation is having a clean slate on the day when Jesus arrives. My interpretation of this, and I don't know if it's correct or not, but my interpretation of, of this group of people would be that um, they're just pretty well sin-free. They're characters. Okay. They're characters. How, how would that happen? Well, I don't know. I'm waiting for that, but it uh, hasn't <laughs> happened to me yet. Um, but but that's kind of you know finally here as a group I think going through these through these trials and tribulations uh, it's it's in a way it's kind of a training exercise it's a it's a a gym you know you're you're going okay. you're building your muscles and you're getting ready now to run the race so to speak or to lift the weights or to throw the javelin or whatever and these previous experiences. Uh, these trials and tribulations have helped these people, this particular group of people, to forge mm -hmm. this kind of a character. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a correct understanding or not, but, but that's my tendency to think. And finally they are there and they stand before the entire universe demonstrating that, that it is possible to, to uh, be like Adam before the fall. Now that would be kind of my inclinations. I don't I, know if that's correct. I would be. I would. I would feel more comfortable if you said it would be possible to be like, to live a life something like the life which Jesus lived when he was here on this earth. Adam lived in a perfect environment. <clears throat> These people are not living in a perfect environment. Jesus did not live in a perfect environment. And the key to how that happens is just one that I know of. I've never read of anything else that's a key to how this happens, and that is. By beholding, we become changed. So these are people who, and go ahead. They have gone through a process, through conditions, which have demonstrated to the universe that these people would rather die mm -hmm. than do anything that they thought was God didn't want them to do. And let's, let's put, let's, I'd like to look at, you know, that's a, a little bit of a negative approach. While I agree with it, I'd like to put it positive. I'd like to say these are people who think living a life like Jesus is the only thing that really matters. They're going to be, they're going to be so focused on, on, on Jesus and how they can live to be more like Jesus that nothing else really matters to them. And, and they're going to stop sinning, but they're not even going to know they've stopped sinning because th their focus is how can I be more like Jesus? Of course, they are slightly different than Jesus in mm -hmm. that they are mere mortals, yes. whereas Jesus was a combination of the two. Yes, I understand that. So, going on next, they have been delivered. So, and we're, we're, we're running out of time before our break here. They have been delivered. We've talked about how they've been delivered. They, they're they're going to be in, the, in, in heaven celebrating their freedom. No lie is found on their lips. They stand before God without fault. That's another characteristic. They have seen the earth hit with famine and pestilence, the seven last plagues. You can read all about that in the book Great Controversy by Ellen White, pages 648 and 49. I might add, these characteristics of the, of the, of the 144,000 are all spelled out there. And we will continue our look at those characteristics in just a moment after our break.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. We're looking at a very special group of people, a group of people who will apparently be translated as opposed to dying and being resurrected. These are the people who will live through the last events of this earth's history prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And they're really the ones who will look up and see the entire sky filled with shining angels. So that would be a nice group to be a part of. I've got a I've got a question about those people. Okay. They seem to be very special people. Mm -hmm. um, very easy to save because of what they are. How how and part of that is because they've been through these trials. It appears part of these trials that they've been through is what's helped make them what they are. So okay. I don't I don't I don't make it that far. Um, let's say Paul didn't make it there. Well, that's a bad illustration, but like my mom, mm -hmm. she didn't live through that time, so she's not as, quotes, good as they are. So, so is she harder to save? No, 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 no. Uh, let's see if we can clarify that. There are certain criteria for salvation, and people from every race and tribe and language and nation, as we mentioned, will be saved. So you don't have to be like the 144,000 to be saved. You don't have to be like the 144,000 to be saved. But God has said from way back that the time would come when he would be able to demonstrate that there are human beings here that choose to be on his side because they choose to be on his side. They're, they're, not, they're not forced. They're not bribed. Nothing like that. They choose to be like Jesus because that's what they, they really think that's the right thing to do and they want to be like that. And they are truly his people. Satan has all the time claimed that virtually everybody who lives on this earth is his. And he, 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 he sort of chides God, God, where are your people? Where are your people? God says, hold on, just wait. They're coming, they're coming. And these are, the, these are they. So, so if I'm alive during all of this, but I don't, somehow I don't make it through those troubles. You can still be saved. You know, I think, I think there's a lot of Seventh-day Adventists who believe if Jesus comes and they're not ready to be 144,000 or whatever, that they're going to be lost. Well, there's going to be, there, there may be a lot of people who are, who are allowed to die in those times. We don't know. I mean, I, I can't read you a verse that answers right. that. But I, things can be very rough. And a lot of people who are savable, and only White does suggest this, Will, 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 will pass away in those very difficult times. Maybe because they're not quite ready to stand like the 144,000. I have a question. Yeah. But people have lived before that were truly, that did everything for God and were killed and mm -hmm. martyred for Jesus. Where do those people fit in or compare to the 144,000? And you know, I'm going to have to let God answer that. <laughs> Job would true. be an example of that. Job would be an example. Yes. Abraham might be an example. Daniel might be an example. There's some wonderful yes. people. Uh, Jesus, what did Jesus have to do to prove his faithfulness to his Father, to demonstrate to the entire universe what it was all about? Live a life without being contaminated by Satan. And ultimately die because of that commitment. Is it any wonder then that the people who he is going to take to heaven can, will, will, will be asked to demonstrate their willingness, their commitment to that same level. Now, they aren't asked to die because God intervenes. But if he didn't intervene, they would die because they're surrounded by people that want to kill them. And, and, and I would suggest that when we get to the place where we may have a chance to talk about the seven last plagues, the first six of those plagues I would suggest, are Satan's direct attempt to destroy God's people. Yeah. If you look at the earth, he's not interested in destroying his own people. He wants to destroy God's people. He would like to destroy all of God's people and then say, God, you know, you can have the rest of the universe. Just leave this earth to me. My, me and my people will live here. You can have the rest of the universe. And God says, not only am I not going to let you do that, I'm going to make this earth my future headquarters. Right. That means Satan is out of it. Yep. So that would be the way I understand it. These people, 
Number point number ten, they have not been deceived by the heresies and false teachings of papal Rome and other Protestant apostate churches that are following her example. Eleven, they refuse to worship the beast or its image, Revelation 14, 5. They fulfill the prophecy of Zephaniah 3, 12 to 15. We haven't looked at that yet. And just, just look at that a second. Zephaniah is about, what, four, four books from the end of the Old Testament, four of those little tiny books. I will leave there a humble and lowly people who will help who will come to me for help. The people of Israel who survive will do no wrong to anyone, tell no lies, nor try to deceive. They will be prosperous and secure, afraid of no one. Sing and shout for joy, people of Israel. Rejoice with all your heart, Jerusalem. The Lord has ended your punishment. He has removed all your enemies. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. There is no reason now to be afraid. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's that kind of people. But before they can stand or even sit with Christ and celebrate their victory, there are three very important messages that must be carried to an apostate world. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has, has considered these three messages, their, their particular message for the world at the end of time. Now, let's, let's put, get the big picture again. We've said it repeatedly that in these sevens, most of these sevens in the, in the book of Revelation, there are six things that happen, then there's a break. And there's, there's a, a, a promise of some kind of reward along with an assignment of something that needs to be done. And then comes number seven. So in the sevens, there's a six and a break and then the seven. So here we have what? We have, we have had six scenes in the, in, in the great controversy. Then we have a break and this is the break. And then we have seven, which is the harvest, which we read at, a little while ago at the end of chapter 14. So... What's going on with these? So, uh, did I understand that these three messages are in the break? These are in the break. Okay. This is the assignment of the peop th that's given to the people who are supposed to be standing basically between number six and number seven. Okay. And who would that be? Thee and thou. <laughs> <laughs> no, say we and us. Don't say thee and thou. Say we and us. This is the assignment. For, and the Adventist Church have, have always taught that that this was our message for end times. That's so right. what does the first angel say? And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give him glory, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea, in the fountains of water. Okay, so what a, are we supposed to be afraid of God? Why does it say fear God? My translation says honor God. My translation says honor God. I think it's probably the same one. So is it fear or is it honor? What's the difference? <laughs> well, this is a use of the, an older use of the word fear, and it means respect and honor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it doesn't mean to be deathly afraid. No. Nothing like that. So we're supposed to respect God and honor Him and praise His greatness for what's, what's, ha what's coming? Decision time. Decision time. Time for Him to judge and worship Him who is the Creator. Okay. okay? So what do you think of, you know, we have, we have here, if, you, if we're looking at this larger context, we have in scene six this fearful beast that's scary to death mm -hmm. and all you know he's demanding that everybody do exactly what he says otherwise they won't be able to eat they won't be able to buy they won't be able to sell etc cetera, etc cetera. between that and the the second coming of Christ we have these messages um, could could really scary messages be part of the good news yeah I was going to ask that <laughs> I was thinking about how you know how is this I thought, I thought the gospel was, was what we're supposed to be preaching. Is, is getting, out of a, getting out of a building that's on fire good news? Is obeying yes. the fire alarm good news? Yes. Well, it, it is, but that's kind of extrapolating <laughs> out of the oh. illustration there or something. We're, like well, hold on. We, have, we, <laughs> we haven't got to chapter 15 and 16. If we, anybody who gets through or has to live through the seven last plagues, they're going to think he's getting out of a building on fire, I think. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, 
And then we come to the second angel. What's the second angel about? Babylon is falling. Uh, Babylon is falling. Now, I want you to sort of get a good mental picture of these things because I'm going to give you a sort of a quiz here in a moment. Okay. So, Babylon, let's just read the actual verses. My version says, A second angel followed the first one, saying, She has fallen. Great Babylon has fallen. She made all peoples drink her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. Okay. Can, can we take just a moment and try to define what that strong wine is? Okay. What, what would, well, in order to understand that, we probably have to talk a little bit about Babylon. What do we know about Babylon? Babylon is what's fallen, and this must be involved in it. Yes. Okay. Is that all the definition you want? No. What was Babylon? <laughs> Babylon's been fallen for a couple, three thousand years. Okay. So is that what it's talking about? But well, what is Babylon talking about? We've okay. Got We've got the old ancient Babylon that the Jews had a history with, and, and we got. Let me just, yeah. And why in the world use that term in the first place? Well, let's let's look at this for a second. We're going to find out when we get to chapter 18. This message is repeated and expanded quite a lot. So this second message is going to be greatly expanded. When we get to chapter 18. But do we have some clue about what, Bab what Babylon is? What the Remember, we said that this book was written by John on the island of Patmos, isolated out there. We wonder how he got anything to write on. We wonder how he got any kind of help at all to do any writing if he, if he needed any help. He's in prison, basically. You know, what's he writing about? And, and, and is he, did he manage to convince some of the Roman guards that this message was a, was a true message? I mean... What, what, what was going on out there? John so, has to get this writing past the censorship. He has to guards. get it past, he has to convince maybe one of these guards to carry it back for him to the mainland. You know, I, I, don't you suspect that the Roman guards out there must have had once in a, little, once in a while a little bit of R&R? &R? <laughs> so why would they even do that? Well, Take good, anything. Good question. Anything at all. But if you, if you made a lot of accusations, just right blatantly, against Rome, do you think, what are the chances that the thing would survive? Do you yeah. think he was writing against Rome? Well, that's let's... What, that's what historians think, but... Why do they today, think that? Well, um, well, there's like this 666 thing in here, which, um, let's, let's, by let's, the way, well... Let's look at some passages. Look at 1 Peter, chapter 5, near, right the last few verses. Start with verse 12. I write you this brief letter with the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful fellow Christian. I want to encourage you and give you, uh, uh, encourage you and give my testimony that this is the true grace of God. Stand for a minute. This is Peter writing to his, the New Testament Christians. Your sister church in Babylon, also chosen by God, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with the kiss of Christian love. So Peter and Mark are in Babylon? They were in Rome. How do you know that? So these are secret code words. For what? For Rome. Well, look at, look at chapter 2. Go, uh, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, Second Peter, chapter 1. Drop down just a few verses, if, unless you have some break between the two books, and start with verse 12. And so, this is Peter writing. And so, and presumably, the scholars believe this is written right near the end of his life. And so, I will always remind you of these matters, even though you already know them and are firmly grounded in the truth you have, you have received. I think it only right for me to stir up your memory of these matters as long as I'm still alive. I know that I shall soon put off this mortal body as the Lord Jesus Christ plainly told me. I will do my best then to provide a way for you to remember these matters at all times after my death. How would you do that? Write a book. Write a book. <laughs> and what book did he write? He told Mark about... Uh, Stories of the Gospel. And Mark wrote down, wrote it down what we call the Gospel of Mark. So what does this tell us? Peter was crucified upside down in the city of Rome. He says, 
Mark and I are in Babylon. Not real Babylon. Babylon at that point in time was a pile of rubble. There was no place to be there. There was not any place to stay at all in, P in Peter's day. So Babylon is a code word for Rome. Okay? So where does that take us in our, in our exploration? Well, one thing I'd, you know, I would think, uh, first of all, what we would say is that we're talking against the world. Wouldn't you say that? I mean, you know, this world, Jesus says the world hates me and all that. Mm -hmm. um, if a person used Babylon as the world, um, Rome would become Babylon because it is the world. Okay. And you go down through time, that, um, that world's going to change because Rome's going to fall and something else is going to come up. So you've got it all the way to the end of time. So what you have here is a symbol representing groups of people down through time that have persecuted the Christian church. Mm, yeah. okay. And sometimes it was other parts of the Christian church. Mm -hmm. Is that what the wine is? Persecution? Sounds like it. I've also... It's about confused doctrine. <laughs> Could be that too. Say, yeah. yeah. I've heard well, that. Well, yeah. In, in, yeah, in, in the, the, the thing that he can confuses everybody with is confused doctrine, yeah. So how do we know if Babylon is a code word? How do we know, don't, how do we know that 144,000 isn't some kind of a code word? And many of these other things aren't code words. Well, I mean, you, you look at the whole context and try to figure out whether there's any kind of code word. I mean, we had a clear picture there that Peter clearly was referring to Rome as Babylon. And remember, remember what's going on here. Peter and Paul were, were, Paul was beheaded and Peter was crucified upside down in a time of terrible persecution for the church under Nero, the Romans, you know, Roman emperor. John is writing this book under the next period of terrible persecution for the Christian church under Domitian. So they're writing these words and, and, they're, and they're using words that they know that the Christian church in general understands what they're talking about while the people outside are going to think, you know, these, these people are crazy. You know, I don't understand all, those, all that nonsense. Just to leave them alone. So that, that would be my understanding. Well, then we come to the third angel. And the first two angels will be followed by a third, which was the most frightening message in, in, in the entire Bible. Would you agree with that, that the third angel's message is the most frightening message in the entire Bible? Can you think of any other th message more frightening? Well, the, the consequences are so dire. How could yeah. it be any more severe? Yeah. yeah. And those who are experiencing that will, will have their final and irreversible destruction, which will result from the last time. So now, you ready for your quiz? John was writing to the early Christian church basically at the turn of the first century. What did these messages mean to them? You mean the message of uh, these three messages? These three or? messages. Okay. What do you they, think? They believe this time was upon them. Okay. And what are they? Well, at what least, are, at least what? very, very near. How do you think they understood it? Well, they might have understood it as though they were going through exactly yeah. what that what what it's talking about there. Yeah. And the very next thing after that uh, is pretty good news. The second coming. Yeah. Yeah. The harvest. So it could have been a comfort to them in that sense. Yeah. Okay. It'd be Lord, pretty yeah. discouraging if they found out how long it would take mm -hmm. from when they got the. Why do you, Why book. do you think God doesn't tell them? Well, because it would be discouraging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're discouraging things here and there, but the overall message of the whole book, as we heard from Leslie Harding, is God wins. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So, big time. Big time. Right here is trouble, but just a few seconds later mm -hmm. it's good it's good news okay so the first message probably meant to them the time is going to come 
when the people who are persecuting us are going to get what's coming to them. And God is going to, God, God's going to rescue us out of this mess. And Babylon has fallen. What would that mean to them? Rome's going down. Rome's going down. Yeah. That, that's, and they would have been, they would have, to them it would have been imperial Rome. Sure. It would have been imperial. The, the emperor was going to be, was going to be wiped out. Okay. And what would the third angel's message mean, mean to them, do you think? Be on the right side. Yeah. Stay true. Stay, stay, stay faithful to God or, or, or you know, you're going you're gonna to suffer the consequences. Right. That sounds very Jewish. Mm -hmm. Many of them were Jews. But I mean... But remember, it's, it's not Jewish so much here because the Jewish religion was an official recognized re religion by the Roman Empire. They recognized religions that which were de directly connected with different nations. Christianity rose out of nothing. And so they, that's why they, they were persecuting Christians. They weren't persecuting so much Jews. I know, but what I'm thinking is it sounds like very much what the Jews of their day thought was going to happen. They expected Jesus to come and get rid of those Romans. It mm -hmm. sounds like the theology is is almost identical in a way. I think that's what they would have thought. Yeah. Now, a, another question that comes along. We know that in the late 1700s and early 1800s, there was a great awakening, Christian awakening. And what happened during that period of time? There was the Lisbon earthquake, 1755. There was the dark day, uh, 1780. There was a falling of the stars over in 1833, and, those, and, and the Pope was taken captive in what looked like the destruction of the Catholic Church in 1798. There was rising nations. The, the American War of Independence took place. The French Revolution took place. All kinds of, I mean, and people looked, and, and that was about the, about the time of the rise of the Industrial Revolution, and everybody thought, man, things are getting better and better, and, and we're, we're fixing the governments, and we're, we've gone from from tyranny to democracy and all this kind of stuff. Whoopee, let's go. And, and, and then people started reading their Bibles. They said, oh, these look like fulfillments of prophecy. We better be reading our Bible. And, and they were reading their Bibles. And, and what was the result of all that? <coughs> there was a Reformation, yes. And how did it happen? Well, let, let me just mention a few things very quickly in the few minutes, a couple minutes we have left. In the late 1700s, someone by the name of Manuel de la Cunza was down in Chile. He was a Jesuit. And he got interested in prophecy and he wrote a book saying, hey, it looks like we're coming to the end of the world. And it was, he was afraid to even publish it because he knew the attitude of the churches in general. So he published it under a false name. Uh, a gentleman from England picked that up, Edward Irving, and realized how significant it was, had it translated into English and, and, and began to preach this message, and thousands of people came out to hear him in England and Scotland. A Jewish gentleman by the name of Joseph Wolf um, lived from 1795 to 1862, uh, was an a absolutely unbelievable linguist, could speak so many languages, and he decided that he wanted a broader education as a Jew, he came to the, to the university at, at Rome and converted to Catholicism. Then he, after he converted to Catholicism, he studied Protestantism for a while and became a Protestant. And he traveled around and he, he got interested in prophecy and there was a lot of others. But the one that's most widely recognized is a gentleman by the name of William Miller. And what's the story of William Miller? And you all as members of the Adventist Church would know the story of William Miller. William Miller was a gentleman who fought in the, in the War of 1812 and so forth. And after that, he went home and he served in, in various ways in his local community. But he, he rose up. I mean, he, he, he began to study his Bible. And he really, really focused eventually on the book of Daniel and concluded that the second coming of Christ was going to happen in about 25 years. And he studied that, and he read other verses and said, no, it can't be because no one knows the hour, the day nor the hour. And, and, and then he come back and he struggled with it. And finally, 
through some interesting circumstances, he was led to preach in one church and people started accepting this. And before long, it was just exploding. There was this huge Advent movement. Uh, people from all different churches came together. There was no organized church. It was just people from all over the place came together. And it's estimated that in, in the northeastern part of what we would now call the United States, there were upwards of 130,000 people who, and that was a huge percentage of the population back in those days, who thought that his preaching was right, and they carried that message through the day of God's judgment. They carried that message through a great day of disappointment um, in what came to be known as the Great Disappointment, October 22, 1844. We'll talk more about that date a little bit later. But um, in the course of that, certain other things happened. And, and let's, let's just review a little bit of what, what, what we have seen here. We have seen that from Rome, Revelation 13 that talks about the devil side in the great controversy, we have now moved to Revelation 14 that talks about the difficulties that, the, that God's people are going to go through, but the rewards that they're going to receive at the end of that, and the second coming of Christ is going to be the ultimate reward that they're going to receive. And in that, those three angels' messages that we've started to talk about are really going to be focused on, uh, going to be the focusing, focused message of that group of people that presumably would be us, the message that we're supposed to be telling the whole world. And we need to understand more clearly what that means, why it's, that message is important, and um, see if we can understand it clearly. We've talked a little bit about the first message. We've talked a little bit about the second message. The third message is the toughest one to understand. And it has been very much misunderstood, even by some very famous theologians, which we might happen to mention, uh, maybe next week as we talk about this. So here we have sandwiched between the seven last plagues, really, and the, the scary stories about the, the lamb-like beast that turns into a dragon-speaking beast. Uh, we have this message, which God has given to his final end-stage people, and the people who are going to be a part of that come to be known as a group called the 144,000, and those people have to stand through the final events on this earth's history, through the final plagues, through the final times of trouble, and so forth. But they will one day look up and see Jesus come in the clouds and say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. See you next week.